Thankfulness. Let me ask you some questions about thankfulness. Is thankfulness something you feel or something you do? In the Old Testament, God had his people purpose into their lives thankfulness, although they did not naturally feel this way. This is most famously demonstrated when God brought the Israelites out of Egyptian slavery, and then they complained about their deliverance and the food that literally fell from heaven. Doesn't it follow that the receivers of mercy ought to be the giver of thanks? Okay, let's say a policeman pulls you over for breaking the law, speeding. Then let's say he does not give you what you deserve, a ticket. What do you think or feel? Are you grateful? Does the gratefulness wear off when you get stuck in traffic a mile down the road? Should thankfulness be something we fall into like a hole? Or is it something we do intentionally like brushing our teeth? God has blessed you. So can you be thankful when he gives? Or can you be thankful when he takes it away? Is it possible to be thankful in the hospital, the unemployment line, or at a gravesite? Sometimes your circumstances are terrific, and sometimes they are horrible. If you are asked to be thankful even when things aren't going great, is that realistic or crazy? Well, good morning. How's everybody doing? Oh, really? That good. Okay, great. Well, I'm glad you're here. Maybe you'll leave in a better mood than you're in now. Man, it's great to be here. My name is Scott. I'm the lead pastor at our Missouri City campus and always excited to be here uh, with an opportunity to come share with you guys and, uh, and just hang out with you. And so I hope you're doing well. I'm excited also because this weekend is my third anniversary here at River Point, and I'm all excited about that. Yeah, thank you. My... Uh, my family and I are so, so proud and so honored to be part of this awesome church and be part of this uh, pastoral team, just seeing what's going on and seeing God's faithfulness working through us and, and uh, all of you guys involved with that. I love what's going on here in West End and Missouri City. Uh, we're just in some really, really awesome days as a church, and I hope you realize that and I hope you know that if you're a visitor with us or a guest today, uh, you've picked a great place to be, and I think you'll feel welcomed and uh, walk away at least feeling encouraged, all right? So that's awesome. It's a great time for our church also because this Because of Others initiative is underway. Thank you all so much for uh, your prayer and your uh, faithful pledges and your giving to our, to our uh, projects, the, the stuff here in Richmond, our West End campus renovation, uh, the school in Uganda, which is going to be beginning very soon. Uh, and then I'm excited especially, I'm a little biased, but I'm excited about the land we're purchasing in Missouri City. Keep praying for that as we're facing some, a little bit of struggle and challenges, uh, just trying to get some of those details worked out. But I'm, I'm praying and just believing uh, that God is providing that for us as we uh, look for a place to, to build a permanent home. So it's just an awesome, awesome time to be part of River Point. I hope you see that. I hope you're glad to be part of it as well. I hope you had a great Thanksgiving. Everybody eat a lot of food and get fat and maybe full and happy and take a nap maybe and watch some football. I hope you did all that fun stuff. And I hope you had a chance at some point in your holiday to... Uh, to do what it was meant to do, and that is to express some gratitude or some thankfulness. Hopefully you slowed down enough, and you sat maybe with your family around the table or some friends, and you just had an opportunity to express some thanksgiving and some thankfulness from your heart. And I hope you did that, because that's what it, it's good for us. It's good to see that. It's good for us to remember those things in our life, and it's good for us to express that. Because within a matter of hours, some of you crazy people went out to the mall and you started like cutting people off and pushing and shoving to get in line. I know you did this. Some of you need to confess that, right? And you need some forgiveness. And next time you do that, uh, don't take the car with the RPC sticker on it, all right? <laughs> We're trying to like do good things in this community. And some of y'all, I know how you drive and how you behave on the road. You're not helping us out, all right? But uh, anyway, I don't know what happens with either you uh, from, from hours from getting up from the table with your family to go into the mall and getting into that crazy stuff and, and remembering uh, from, you know, from what we just celebrated and thankfulness to all of a sudden we need more stuff, right? We got to get the deal. Whether that happened for you within those 24 hours or whether it's going to happen to you uh, later this week or this month, as, as is always the case so often for me, and you have that moment where you're, you know, the warm fuzzies come over you. Man, I'm so thankful and so grateful and I love you and all that. And then just life starts happening again. And before long, we just kind of forget. We kind of forget all the things we just talked about 
at the Thanksgiving table. We forget all the things we have to be thankful for because we're in kind of this grind of life, right? We're busy. There's a lot going on. Many of us are just got, we've got our heads down. We're kind of charging ahead. We're fighting the fight. We're just trying to survive day in and day out. And when you're in the midst of all of that, especially when our circumstances are, are not going the way we want them to go, we lose sight of the things to be thankful for. We forget. We're just forgetful people. We have a tendency to forget stuff. We just do in life. It happens to me a lot, and I'm not saying it's because I'm a man that it happens more often than it may happen for others, but my wife may tend to agree with that idea. We were, we were uh, talking the other day, and uh, actually I was looking on my phone, and I had seen this video on YouTube. It was, uh, I think it was the late show uh, with uh, James Corden, that new guy, right? He's doing the show, and he's on there with, uh, singing a song with Alanis Morissette. Do you all remember this lady from the 90s? I don't know why she was so angry all the time, right? But she was, and so they're singing this duet. She's kind of making this comeback, and it was really kind of a funny video. And so I go to take it to my wife to show her, and I'm like, oh, honey, I got this cool video I want to show you. It's on my phone. I'm trying to pull it up. And she's like, she's, I look up at her, and she's got that look. Husbands, do you know the look? And I'm like, what did I, what did I do? And, she's, and I'm like, I just want to show you this funny thing. It's really awesome. Somebody showed it to me, and I'm trying to pull it up. And I look at her again, and she's got that look. And I'm like, what? And she said, do you not remember I showed you the video like two days ago. Do you not remember us sitting there in the, in the living room looking at the video, laughing and having this whole moment together? It was funny. Do you remember that? I'm like, no, somebody else showed me that at work. And she's like, no, it was me. We totally sat there and did that together. Do you not? And, and I, as a guy, I guess, no excuses, I just totally forgot. For me, it was some other experience, some other moment. And for her, it was like, it was like this thing, like we had this moment together. And I, in my idiocracy, we totally forgot. And that happens to me so much. Man, sometimes it's little things, and we all forget little things, right? There's all details. There's a lot of stuff coming at us, and we forget those things. But sometimes, especially if it's a pattern, right, if it's this tendency we have in a relationship, if you're the forgetter, you don't think about it. You don't realize the impact it's having. But if you're the other person and that person keeps forgetting all the things you've talked about, all the moments you've had together, over time what it does to the relationship is it causes a strain. And the rela- she's, as like, she's, at, she's saying to me, like, and here's what she actually said to me. She said, were you not present when we had this conversation? Anybody ever heard that? Like, were you there? Am, am I making this up? And, and it, over time it, it causes problems for a relationship because to her, it's like all these things we talked about and all these moments we had didn't matter to me. And over time, those things can hurt. And it's the same thing in our relationship with God. It's the same thing when we talk about this idea of being thankful and being grateful. The problem you and I have so often is not that we're ingrate, ungrateful or you know, we, we, we're not thankful for things. It's that we just tend to forget about them. It's the fact that we're just too busy, distracted, consumed with our own self that we forget all the things we have to be thankful for. And we forget so often to express that gratitude to people in our lives, especially in our relationship with God. As you look back in your relationship with God, if you have a relationship with God, there's so many things that he's already done and so many things that describe who he is for us that we have to be thankful for. If you're here and you don't have that and you're thinking, you know, I don't even know if this stuff is real. I don't know if I believe in this God or Jesus guy or whatever. That's fine. Listen, I hope that through the course of today, at least what you'll do this season is think about people in your life you're thankful for. And you'll start to see the blessings that you have in your life. And maybe through that, somehow God will speak to you and, re- and, and, and reveal that it was him who's given that to you. That's my hope for you. But for those that have a relationship already, there's so much we have to be thankful for. So many ways that God has made himself real and known to us. We just forget about it. And here's some encouraging news, at least for me. This idea of forgetfulness, right, that I struggle with every day of my life. This is, here's, here's some good news, right? Ready? Forgetfulness isn't a new problem. It's not a new problem. It's not a result of the 21st century and technology and phones and the media and all the busyness and all this. It's not a new thing. Forgetfulness, as we look in Scripture today, has been an issue for humanity from the very beginning, especially 
when it comes to our relationship with God and all the things that God has done and blessed us with and reasons that we have to be thankful. It's not a new problem. In Deuteronomy, there's a story, that the story of God's people, where they had been in captivity in Egypt. You've probably heard the story, seen the movie, whatever, go back and read it. They're in Egypt. Moses shows up to free the people. They get out of Egypt. They go through the Red Sea. It's an awesome story. Now they're in the desert preparing to go into the promised land, which God had told them about some 500 years before this. And now it's time to go in the promised land. And just before Moses hands the baton to Joshua, who's going to actually lead the people in, God tells Moses to tell the people some things so they'll remember some things that God has done. And, and here's why I think I love this part of this story. Because if it was me roaming around in the desert, and if it was me about to go in the promised land and enjoy all the good stuff God was going to give us as a people, I would need to be reminded of God's faithfulness. Just like the people, God knows their hearts and their minds and their tendency to forget just like he knows us. And all through scriptures, all through even the Jewish culture and the Jewish faith, there's so much built in about remembering, remembering, remembering. And look at what God tells him in Deuteronomy chapter 8. He says, take care, speaking through Moses, take care lest you what? Forget the Lord your God by not keeping his commandments, his rules, and his statutes, which I command you today, lest, here he goes, Here's where you and I so often get this messed up, right? How, lest when you have eaten and are full and have built good homes and houses and live in them, and when your herds and your flocks multiply and your silver and gold is multiplied and all that you have is multiplied, then your heart be lifted up and you forget the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery, who led you through the great and terrifying wilderness with its fiery serpents and scorpions and thirsty ground where there was no water, who brought you water out of the flinty rock, who fed you in the wilderness with manna that your fathers did not know, that he might humble you and test you to do good, to do you good in the end. Beware, here it is, here's our problem, here's our tendency to forget. Beware lest you say in your heart, and now he's quoting the people. Here's what we say. My power and the might of my hand have gotten me this wealth. See, that's where we mess it up. When things are going really, really, really good for us, when we've experienced tremendous blessing and favor and success, like the people of God were about to when they got to the promised land. I mean, it was going to be incredible for them once they got settled and everything was going. And we see that in the story. It's amazing. And he says, you shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you power to get wealth, that he may confirm his covenant that he swore to your fathers, that is it is this day. Do you see what God's trying to do? I mean, it's not a new problem. The people then, as they were about to experience some really awesome stuff, were going to tend to forget. God knew this. He knows it today. We tend to forget. And he wants them to remember his goodness and his faithfulness. And you fast forward about 500 years. They've settled the land. They've conquered it. It's now the kingdom of Israel. And David is on the throne. David, the, the same David who killed Goliath, the same David who God chose to be the king, he's now ruling and he's experienced. Go back and read the story of David. There's a lot of mistakes along the way, a lot of, a lot of things that David has done. But God says David was a man after his own heart. That kind of a guy who wrote, Many of the psalms in the Bible, if you go to the book of Psalms, many of the words of the songs that we sing at church are words David wrote thousands of years ago as he reflected upon his relationship with God. And in Psalm 103, David writes, and I, I think it's so interesting and so, uh, it's so encouraging to me as a guy who forgets often that even David wanted to be careful not to forget. Look at what he said in Psalm 103. He said, bless the Lord, O my soul. And all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul. And what? Forget not all his benefits. David's writing scripture. And he's telling himself and the people and you and me, what? Not to forget the benefits of a relationship with God. And he goes on to describe that. He forgives all our iniquities. He heals all your disease. Who redeems your life from the pit. Anybody ever been in the pit? I mean, you look at your life and your story, and you, man, you were in the pit. You hit rock bottom. There was nowhere to go. And somehow God, because of his love and grace and mercy, 
rescued us and pulled us up from that. Man, that's amazing. He crowns you with steadfast love and mercy who satisfies you with good so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. And he goes on. And he says, the Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. Go back and look at the list of things David's remembering here. The stuff he didn't want to forget. The benefits of a relationship with God, the goodness of God. That he forgives, he heals, he redeems, he crowns us, satisfies. And who, who is God? He's merciful, gracious, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love. This describes who God is. This describes the things that God has done for David and he's done for you and me. And David so much doesn't want to forget the faithfulness of God. And we fast forward about 500 more years. The prophet Jeremiah in the book of Lamentations. This was a book written to mourn and grieve the destruction of Israel, of Jerusalem. The kingdom that David once ruled on, the, the kingdom that his son Solomon led, is now in shambles. We talked about this a few weeks ago in our study of Nehemiah. As the, as the exiles ended up in Babylon and Nehemiah went back, remember, to build the wall. That's because it was destroyed by the Babylonians. And, 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 and Jeremiah wrote the story and he recorded the events of that destruction. And his heart is broken for his people. And as he writes in Lamentations, the first two chapters, and you can read it, it just goes through thing after thing after thing that have happened to his people. The, the worst possible circumstances for God's people. Everything that they believe to be true. The blessings of the land that God had given them now taken away. Everything's destroyed. No reason to have hope. But yet, Jeremiah looks to the faithfulness of God. Look at what he says in Lamentations. And again, this forgetfulness that, that we tend to have. Look at Jeremiah. And he said, but this I call to mind. This, this phrase means to recall, to remember. Jeremiah himself, God's chosen prophet, speaking on behalf of God, writing the book of Lamentations in the midst of the worst thing possible for his people. And what is he having to do? Remember. And therefore, because I can remember God's faithfulness, I have hope. He goes on and he says, The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul, therefore I will hope in him. Great is your faithfulness. In your own life, in our life, when, when the circumstances have gotten so bad, and really it happens on both extremes, Right? Either things are so bad and we're so consumed what's going on in our lives, or things are so great we forget. We forget God's faithfulness. We forget all the things that he's done and all the ways he's blessed us. And the, the fact that we can have a relationship with him through Christ is such a blessing we forget. And because we tend to forget, we don't have thankful hearts. We don't live thankful lives. And the key to this for us is to remember God's faithfulness. Remembering God's faithfulness fuels our thankfulness. Remembering God's faithfulness fuels our thankfulness. If you and I are going to learn to have thankful lives and live lives full of gratitude, we've got to go back over and over in our lives and remember the faithfulness of God. Because there's so much he's done for us. There's so many ways he's been faithful. What, is, what does faithfulness mean to you? The, the word faithful we often use in everyday life. We're talking about our marriage or our friendship or our relationship. The, the idea that that person that, or this relationship is a committed relationship. We're going to be faithful. We're going to stand by them. We're going to get their back. We're going to be with them all in, right? That's the idea of faithfulness. Faithfulness may also mean to you, you may think of it in terms of like you're a faithful fan of some team, okay? Like here's the thing. I can't seem to understand why some of you are still faithful Cowboys fans. How is that possible? I don't get that. I mean, that's faithful right there. Right? At least come to the Texan side. We got like two more wins, right? Yeah. All right. Some of you are mad. I'm, so, I'm sorry. You're offended. All right. 
that's faithfulness right there, right? Maybe your, maybe your idea of faithfulness is, is, maybe you haven't experienced faithfulness in a, in a lot of relationships, and so that may not be where you look to faithfulness or, or your team or whatever. Maybe, maybe the idea of faithfulness brings up this idea of like an old dog you might have had, right? Like the old hunting dog, like the dog's faithful. If nobody else in my life is faithful, at least this dog is faithful. All I got to do is feed him. He doesn't complain, right? He doesn't want to talk or share his feelings. He just, he's by my side, right? That's faithful. I had a dog like that one time that I would say was probably very faithful. My, we grew up on some property out, it wasn't really the country, it was sort of, and we had some space, and, and so we had dogs running around. They were never dogs we bought. They were always like, uh, you know, like stray dogs that wandered up, and we would keep them. We'd feed them. They didn't have anywhere to go, and, and my sister and I were, were real creative in how we named our dogs. So like if the dog came up in the yard and it was brown, we called it brownie. And if it was black, it was called blacky. And white, it was whitey. I mean, it was really easy. You knew which dog was which. And it wasn't until much later that I realized really kind of how culturally insensitive our dog names were. <laughs> I mean, we were just kids, right? We didn't mean anything by it, but that's how we did it. We had this dog one time. My dad never liked the dogs. He never wanted the dogs. He just tolerated them. Well, one time the dog, I forget which color, the dog had gotten so, uh, I guess under my dad's skin, he was so sick and tired of the dog that when we were at school one day, dad loaded the dog in the car and he drove about three miles down the road where the bayou ran through our community and he stopped the car. I have to say he stopped the car because I said earlier he threw the dog out and it was like, oh, but he stopped the car. He stopped the car, he opened the door and he pushed the dog out onto the side of the road and he drove home. And he left the dog. I mean, he totally abandoned the dog, right? And you could judge him if you want. That's fine. He's since been forgiven for that. But here's the thing. We get home from school, and we're looking like, you know, where's the dog? And there's no dog. And my dad comes home from work. And we're like, Dad, the dog's gone. And he's like, must have run away. <laughs> and we were like, oh, it's so sad. And we were just kind of mourning the loss of our wonderful dog. Well, we go around the corner, and on the gate of our fence is the dog's collar hanging on the fence. And my sister and I look at each other, and we're like, Dad! And they're like, what? The dog. And he's like, sorry, the dog ran away. And we're like, so did he undo his own collar and hang it before he left? I mean, how did this doesn't add up, Dad. And I, I'm thinking, man, my dad got rid of my wonderful dog. I mean, he, he kept the collar. I mean, it was a $5 collar, right? But he got rid of the dog. And so we're sad and we're mourning this whole thing. Well, it was funny, awesome story, because like two or three days later, guess who came back? Yes! The dog found his way home three or four miles away, and my sister and I were so excited. We're looking at our dad like, <laughs> right? It was like karma got my dad, right? It was so awesome. That, that is a faithful dog right there, right? However you think of faithfulness, right? God is way more faithful. However you see it, even if you have the most faithful friendship or marriage or relationship, when we look at the faithfulness of God, it is so much more. And when we recognize that God's faithfulness, then what it does for us is it begins to cause us a sense of gratitude and thankfulness, even in the midst of difficulties in our life. And that's the challenge for us. We've got to really learn how to see God's hand at work in our lives we got to be able to look back and see those times in our relationship with God where even when it didn't seem like it, God was there. And God was providing and God was faithful. And it's hard, especially when circumstances get tough, when things aren't going the way we want them to go, when we, we get discouraged and we get beat down and we get, we get, we get upset. We, we, we miss out on the opportunities to experience the gratitude and the thankfulness because we're forgetting all the ways God's been with us. I think about it like this. If you're married and you, uh, you, you however long you've been married, right? However long it is. My wife and I, Amy, we've been married for uh, almost 20 years. And in any marriage relationship, there's, there's bumps along the way, right? Some of them are little bitty speed bumps. Some of them are bigger challenges. Some of them are tough. And you might be going through something in your marriage now that seems like there's no hope of it getting better. It seems like all the effort and all the work and all the, all the stuff that you've tried is not working. And you might feel like your marriage is crumbling right around you today. And when you're going through stuff like that in your, in your marriage relationship, 
What often helps us, it doesn't always fix it all, but what it helps to do is to look back, right? If you go sit and talk to a counselor or somebody that's trying to help you think about it, what they often want you to do is, okay, let's go back five years, 10 years, 15 years. Tell me something about your relationship that was, that was amazing. Tell me the, 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 the best time you can remember. And you go back and you think, man, when we were dating, things were awesome. And we really loved each other. We got along. We liked being around each other. We had fun together. Even, even five years ago, things were a whole lot better. And you, you have these memories that you cherish because you're going through tough times now. And if you forget the good times, you, you, you're, out of, you're out of gas. You're out of energy. It's not even feels like it's worth fighting for. But if you can go back and remember those great things, man, it just something stirs in you like, okay, we can do this. Or if you're fighting with kids, like if you're raising children, especially when they get to become teenagers. Our oldest is, is 16 now, he's a junior in high school, trying to figure out what this is going to look like for him. And, and man, as you struggle with teenagers, as they become rebellious, as they stop listening to you, as your relationship with your kids becomes strained and, and stressed because of their choices and their rebellion in life, man, it's tough and, and you, it's hard to be thankful for that. But sometimes you sit and you might look at some pictures or you might think of some stories from years ago and you're like, oh man, I remember when he was so sweet. <laughs> I remember before he could talk how awesome it was, right? How, how cool he was or she was and how they used to like us and actually want to be around us and show some affection. To, you know, I remember the good times. And when you're going through the difficult stuff, Remembering back to the good things can help us. And even in the midst of very difficult circumstances with your marriage, your kids, or other relationships, or at work, you and I can still find ways to be thankful for those people and those circumstances in our life. And I think that's so key for us in order to figure out how to live a thankful life, how to see ourselves in light of what God's doing and his faithfulness to all of us. We have so many reasons to be thankful. That's the challenge for us. And I think all of us would want to say, man, I wish I could, I, could, I could be more thankful. I wish I could feel more thankful. If you got through Thanksgiving and you sat with your family and friends or whoever you were with and you shared things and, man, there were some people sitting around the table, they just seemed like they were oozing thankfulness and you were like, hmm, like maybe you came up with a couple things to say because you'd look bad if you didn't have anything to say. But when you really think about it, deep down in your heart, it, it just wasn't there. There just, there just doesn't seem to be a sense of thankfulness. How, how do we develop that? How do we get to a point where we can live that way in light of God's faithfulness? Paul writes in the New Testament, the book of Colossians, some thoughts on this. As I kind of wrap this up with you, I want to show you this because I think it's encouraging to me, hopefully to you, that in light of God's faithfulness, in light of who God is and what he's done for us, we have reason to be thankful. Look at what he says in Colossians chapter 2. Therefore, as you receive Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith, just as you were taught. What does this say? Read it with me. Abounding in thanksgiving. Look at what Paul's saying. He's saying, in light of this relationship with Christ, therefore, as you receive Christ, so in light of that relationship, being walking with him and being rooted and built up in him, abound, be abounding in thanksgiving. The connection here is that in li because of what Jesus has done for us, there ought to be some thanksgiving coming out of us. And he goes on in chapter 3 and he says this, And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be what? Thankful. See, there's something going on here Paul's trying to get us to see. As, as followers of Jesus, because of God's faithfulness, because of God's mercy and love and his grace, we have reason to be thankful. We have lots of reason to be thankful. And in fact, we ought to be uh, spilling over in thankfulness. The more that we experience the grace and the gift of Jesus, the more we experience his faithfulness in our lives, the more we're being filled up with God's goodness and his mercy and his grace and the truth and the peace of Jesus, the more we experience this, the more we begin to overflow. That's what that word abounding means. It means it's 
overflowing. It's in excess. It's like crazy amount of thanksgiving. And if we allow Christ to fill us, what happens? And when we remember God's faithfulness, what happens is thanksgiving just begins to spill out of us. This, this sense of gratitude and thankfulness in our heart. And man, I want you to imagine for a second, what would this do to your marriage, your relationship with your kids, at work, wherever it is you are, whoever it is you're with, what would it look like in those relationships if you and me learned to remember and recognize God's faithfulness and allow that to fill us up in that relationship that we have with Christ? What would happen if we were abounding in thanksgiving? What would happen to the people around us every day when we got up in the morning and we recognized God's faithfulness? What would happen every day when we got up and thought, thanked God for all that it's he's given us and all that he is to us? What would that do to your people in your life? How would that improve your relationships? There's something power, powerful about remembering God's faithfulness. Even in the great times or in the worst of times, we have reason to be thankful. But here's the key to this, this idea of being thankful and grateful. Here's the, here's the thing. If you don't have it in your heart, you won't practice it. If you don't have it in your heart, you won't practice it. You can fake it for a while. We, we're good at that, right? Like you did maybe at the Thanksgiving table. Yeah, I'm so thankful for my family, my friends, and my stuff, and all this. You, we, we can fake it, but it's not real. After a while, that gets tired. That gets exhausting. It gets, it gets old. It doesn't matter. It's not true. It's not authentic. Because we don't have the gratefulness and the thankfulness in our hearts. My hope for myself, and maybe this encourages you somehow or challenges you, what I need to do is recognize God's faithfulness more and more in my life. I need to re realize that because of Christ, man, we have all we need. We have all the reason in the world to be thankful. Even in the midst of the difficult times, God is with us. And maybe what it takes for you is something very practical, something that will help you Remember this. And I want to challenge you to do this. Sometime this week or during the holiday season, get away for a second by yourself. Take a drive. Take a walk. Go sit somewhere and reflect on. Take your Bible. Read through the faithfulness of God. Recognize all the things in your life that God has done, the way he's shown up for you and the way that he's provided for you and protected you, even maybe when you didn't see it. And thank God for those things. Something will happen inside of us when we do that. It, it'll, it'll begin to fill us with this sense of gratitude, first to God and then to the people in our lives. And then once you make a list, I mean, write it down. Put it on your phone. Take a piece of paper, something. Jot those things down. If you do that, you can't help but begin to feel thankful. You can't help but to begin to be filled with the goodness and the, and the faithfulness of God. And then do the next thing, and that is go, go share that with somebody. If there's somebody that shows up on your list that you're thankful for in a relationship, don't miss the opportunity to tell them. The more we experience God's faithfulness, the more we'll be thankful. And I want you to know this. It doesn't, it doesn't matter what may be going on in your life today. You might be celebrating. You might be the, as successful as you've ever been. Everything may be going great. Don't forget God's faithfulness. Or right now, your life may be a wreck. You may be struggling. You might be uh, suffering. You might have experienced loss or defeat or pain or some type of suffering. You may be in the pit right now. God is faithful. And as we experience that and remember that, man, it does something to us. I need that. Do you need that? Remember God's faithfulness. As we close Warren's going to come back and sing the words of a familiar song that you probably have heard. If you know it, I want to encourage you to sing along with us as he sings this song. Listen to the words of God's faithfulness, and then we'll close.